good morning uh, on behalf of ceylon college of medicine um, i would like to welcome you all to today's uh, teaching capsule on toxidromes uh, today we have a very eminent speaker who does not need introduction dr ganak sena ratna uh, he is the he is a consultant physician and he is the consultant physician in charge of the Uh, emergency treatment center of the uh, teaching hospital karapitiya without taking much of a time i would like to invite ganaka to start with his presentation over to you ganaka thank you madam for uh, your kind words of introduction uh, good morning everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, president and the council of ceylon college of physicians mm -hmm. for giving me this opportunity to talk in this uh, teaching capsule so uh, good morning all of you the topic today is toxidrome and in fact it looks like a bit of a alien word um but i was asked by a couple of my friends uh, last night even what is this uh, toxidrome is all about well it's even though the word is new uh, i believe it we can sort of uh, understand that it's mainly a, a toxin and a syndrome so if there's a syndrome caused by a dangerous level of toxin in the body you could call it a toxidrome and um, it's often the consequence of a drug overdose but in sri lankan scenario it could be a pesticide it could be a herbicide it could be a plant poison as said well. whatever it is if the syndrome the constellation of uh, signs and symptoms are due to a toxin you call it a toxidrome now uh, our standard teaching tells us the causes of any syndrome when whenever a patient when we whenever we are encountered with a patient we need to have an etiological uh, sort of a diagnosis for the syndrome like uh, we think about infective causes we think about inflammatory causes we think about vascular causes and we think about metabolic causes we think about hereditary so list goes as like neoplastic and so so as toxin so whenever whenever you encounter a patient think about whether these signs and symptoms are due to a toxin in that case it is called a toxidrome i think we all are clear about this word uh, what this toxidrome is um, this will be the outline of my talk i would give you some figures and general principles of management of a poison patient and common toxidromes now i would try to take you through a couple of uh, case scenarios and um, uh, with uh, depending on the time permits right so uh, mortality of uh, uh, poison in east said to be 20% but it is in the west it's about 0.5% so this tells us something about our management about uh, the the diagnosis and a lot of lot of uh, things are been told by these figures perhaps when we uh, when we um, study this as a toxidrome perhaps we could come to early diagnosis and early management so that we could bring this uh, mortality down in us the number of annual admissions uh, due to a poisoning is about 250000 per year uh, i don't have national figures uh, for sri lanka but in karapitiya we do get around 600 to 800 admissions due to poisons and which is actually 4% of the total admissions to be honest so you can see the burden of this disease i mean the number of patients been admitted due to toxins the number of toxidromes you're going to see in your day to day life so it's about 600 to 800 patients a year and common toxins we encounter in karapitiya is uh, pesticides herbicides and medicinal drugs right 
Uh, now we come to the principles of uh, management of any poison patients. Uh, first of all, we need to resuscitate these patients if they are physiologically unstable. And then go for, once the patient is resuscitated, you go for evaluation by focus history, focus physical examination, and investigation, and coming at a diagnosis. Um, then you need to embark on the management. Principally, it will be de decontamination, antidote, elimination, and supportive care for a poison patient. Right, let's talk about resuscitation a bit. So who need resuscitation? If the patient is physiologically unstable on admission, they need resuscitation. So altered physiology and abnormal physiology need to be sorted before we evaluate the pathology. That is a golden principle we need to keep in our mind. How do you resuscitate these patients? By, the, uh, 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 by A, B, C, D, E. Once the patient is resuscitated, so the advantages being um, you stabilize the physiology, Stabilizing the physiology would delay certain cardiorespiratory arrest and death. Then you have time for evaluation. So not only you are stabilizing the patient, if you do A, B, C, D correctly, you could sort of guess, uh, get some clues towards the pathology as well, especially in exposure. So this pathology could be a toxidrome. In that case, you need to, you can guess and you can get some clues about toxin as well. So ladies and gentlemen, resuscitation is a must in physiologically unstable patients and it's really, really important. Then we come to the evaluation of the pathology. Once the patient is resuscitated, the next part is the evaluation of the pathology. That is by uh, uh, focus history in the first place. Uh, what you get in the history is um, sometimes people might say, I have taken such and such a toxin, but some people might not. In a patient who says I have taken tablets, then we need to take need, we need to know what tablets were taken, and then when the time period is very important. And some people get uh, co-ingestion like alcohol and other stuff will be taken with these uh, 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 substances. And then the past medical history is really really important, especially uh, the, the patient have concomitant diseases like, for an instance, a person who comes with paracetamol poisoning, you need to know whether the patient is cirrhotic, whether he had uh, hepatitis, so and so forth. In a patient who has taken uh, tricyclic antidepressant, it would be better to know whether the patient has cardiac disease, arrhythmias, kind of background problems. Very, very important. And then the psychiatric illness. Why the psychiatric illnesses are important is mainly um, these toxins, the drugs people have ingested are related to psychiatric medicine, most of the time it would be antidepressants, antipsychotics, kind of stuff. And then the suicidal notes will be really important and attempts to decide the place of management, whether, the, whether we need um, immediate psychiatric care and attention to these people. So this is focus history for you guys. And, but we need to remember something. If you take this history from the person himself or the patient, it could be a bit unreliable. They might not tell the history as it is, as correctly. Therefore, it's, we need to have a habit of asking from the family members, friends, what happened, when was that happened, what was he doing. Try to get the exact event, sequence of events, then you can judge what has happened. And importantly, these uh, history points should be correlated with the signs, symptoms, and investigation results. People might say, I have uh, I had some drink, but then you might have a person with uh, a, a bradycardia. They might not tell, I have taken uh, organophosphate. So if the patient comes with a bradycardia, I always need to think uh, retrospectively whether the person has ingested OP poison or canero or something like that. That's why the history has to be correlated with signs, symptoms, and investigation. Very, very important. And then don't forget direct questions to rule out or have an idea about the relevant differential diagnosis. For an instance, if a person presented with unresponsiveness or respiratory failure, um, it could be due to uh, opioids, heroin kind of stuff, but then head injury has to be uh, looked into. So you need to ask about a head injury, any uh, fever kind of stuff. Right, moving to physical examination. 
by the physical examination of this uh, toxin ingested people you could uh, categorize them into two the uh, main points need to be examined are vital signs and mental state by these two things you could categorize them into two what are those physiologically excited and cns stimulated set of paper and physiologic depressed and cns depressed set of patients so physiologically excited people would come with uh, high heart rate high respiratory rate high blood pressure fever and agitated so that is the set of people who have elevated excited physiology and cns status um typically due to anticholinergics and sympathomimetics and the other set who have depressed physiology and cns or mental depression would present with low heart rate respiratory rate low blood pressure perhaps hypothermia as well and drowsiness uh due to opioids sedatives and cholinergic agents then you can get some very very important clues can uh, fetch some clues if you do a pupil examination if you smell them uh, if you uh, go through the neuromuscular abnormalities go for skin changes and bowel sounds very very important so couple of important stuff from pupils of order neuromuscular abnormalities skin changes bowel sounds would tell you what type of a uh, toxin that they have taken for instance pinpoint pupil could be due to cholinergics or opioids as we all know and dilated pupils could be due to sympathomimetics or anticholinergics bubble sounds very very important even though i know people are not listening uh, in day to day uh, practice but it's very really really important hyperactive bubble sounds will be there in cholinergics and sympathomimetics and hyperactive bubble sounds will be there in opioids and anti cholinergics right moving to relevant investigations so ecg i would say is a must at the outset because it gives you a lot of clues not only a cardiac diagnosis but if you have some sort of abnormalities you can retrospectively predict the type of toxin they have ingested for an example if the patient has tachycardia and wide qrs in a correct setup we know the wide qrs and uh, could be due to sodium channel blockers so a person might have taken a um, uh, tricyclic antidepressant or any other anti arrhythmic as well um, bradycardia if you see a patient with bradycardia it could be due to op it could be due to coronary a lot of things so in a correct clinical context you need you could sort of guess what type of toxin they have ingested by looking at the ecg itself blood sugar is really really important to rule out one thing hypoglycemia and use and knee renal functions are important as well as if the facilities are available toxicology screening right in in diagnosis you need to make a diagnosis is it toxidrome so when you see the patient assess the physiological status cns status and clues from other stuff would tell you um and then the couple of investigations would tell you whether this is a toxidrome or not and then what is the specific toxin of course we need to exclude important differential diagnosis as well right ladies and gentlemen we have a number of toxidromes these are the major ones sedatives cholinergics sympathomimetics and anti cholinergics now let's try to uh, dissect these by uh, case scenarios i hope so far you have understood the principles of this uh, class right patient number 1 uh, young high school student was brought by his friends who has been found unresponsive in his uh, let's say in his hostel so his heart rate was 60 respiratory rate was 8 blood pressure 170 temperature normal saturation 82 on room air and his gcs was 8 so what does this patient need up front is he physiologically depressed or is he physiologically stimulated looks like he is physiologically down isn't he he has low heart rate 
respiratory rate kind of saturation low and his gc is also low so this person needs resuscitation at upfront so how do you resuscitate this patient airway first of all airway was patent but he need a oropharyngeal airway to prevent he getting aspirations and all as of low gcs that was done his respiratory rate was 8 with saturation 82 so he needed 100% oxygen which uh, sort of uh, helped to increase his saturation actually uh, circulation was marginal so we have started him on iv fluid gcs was 8 pupils were pinpoint and but plant were down and his uh, cbs was 120 there was no problem with hypoglycemia and exposure he had uh, normal temperature but there was no head injury and he had injection marks so uh, after a b c d e we were able to secure his airway by opa and we were able to give him some oxygen which brought his saturation up to 94 95 level and he was fixed into iv fluids for his circulatory issues not only that we were able to get we are we are able to get some clues as well um seems like he doesn't have any head injury this is a person who present with unconscious small pupils kind of and he has iv injection marks as well so evaluation uh, history he was at a party with friends before he collapsed now the physiology is stable now it's a time for you to evaluate this patient what type of pathology he is in he was seen smoking while others were dancing but there was no psychiatric illness or suicidal attempts before examination his pupils were small there was no neck stiffness no axillary reflexes planted down no in uh, no head injury he has very sluggish bowel sounds as well his cardiovascular and abdomen was normal investigation is it shows uh, sinus bradycardia uh, no qrs or qt issues blood sugar was normal blood gas showed uh, ph 7.1 with pco to 70 which was respiratory acidosis due to ventilatory failure so what are the differential diagnosis we could arrive at can this be a pontine hemorrhage ladies and gentlemen of course this patient has become unconscious all of a sudden so he has respiratory depression has pinpoint pupils so there are some features favoring pontine hemorrhage but uh, his uh, there were no other focal neurological signs there's no exaggerated reflexes plant was down so it's a bit unlike isn't it could it be a postictal period could could he had a fit and now coming with postictal period well there was no fits observed and no history of epilepsy as well he was at a party seeing by other people as well could it be a crate bite which is very very unlikely in this scenario in this environment but he, he, the clinical signs and symptoms there are few things pinpoint pupils respiratory failure kind of if you see a person who was found early in the morning in a in a in a hena or somewhere that is the diagnosis we we would go for this type of scenario um then could it be a sedative toxidrome then if you don't if you are, if you if all the symptoms and signs are not telling with the bow so he has physiological depressed state mental depressed state young man all of a sudden so it could be a toxin isn't it could it be a benzodiazepine they come with cns depressed state but the pupils not that pinpoint and their vitals is not that uh, down as cell but how about opioids physiological depressed with ventilatory failure pinpoint pupils and uh, he is on respiratory failure and he has iv injection marks as well. so ladies and gentlemen he looks like to be in a sedative toxidrome right what is the management for this uh, sedative toxidrome there are four principles as we discussed decontamination antidote elimination if needed and then uh, supporting uh, so you would need uh, gastric lavage and uh, activated charcoal in the correct way to prevent his aspirating and all antidote what's the antidote he need he need naloxone so this patient had been given naloxone boluses couple of them which causes uh, to reverse his uh, gcs and uh, increase his respiratory rate and oxygenation but then we had to put him on for a naloxone infusion as he was going back to um drowsiness then and there 
and supportive care was observed for respiratory failure and he was referred to psychiatric care right in a summary uh, sedative toxidrome could be due to sedatives or opioids you can see in this uh, chart if it is due to opioids you get cns depression even in the sedative you get that pupils in uh, opioids will be definitely meiosis but in a sedative like a benzodiazepine it's it won't be that myotic but it's variable vitals in opioids definitely bradypnea apnea low heart rate uh, or uh, bradycardia kind of but in uh, benzodiazepine it's not that physiologically unstable um examples would be benzodiazepine barbiturate for sedatives opioids you know it's uh, morphine heroin methadone kind of stuff right ladies and gentlemen what are the tips to remember or the learning points if you see a young man young person with otherwise healthy coming with physiological depressed state with ventilatory failure cns depressive symptoms in the absence of focal neurological signs only with meiosis you need to think about uh, sedative toxidrome when you see iv injection marks it's time to think about opioids so think about sedative toxidrome due to opioids and naloxone is the antidote right we are moving to the next patient patient number 2 55 year old farmer is found unconscious in the field of in the field 2 to 3 hours earlier so he was brought in by the other farmers and his saturation was 90 on admission respiratory rate 30 pulse rate 50 blood pressure unstable it's 80 and gcs was 10 and temperature was 37 so what this what does this patient need on admission is he physiologically stable or unstable so he is physiologically unstable so he needs resuscitation so airway was obstructed because a lot of secretions were there and secretions were sucked out and oropharyngeal airway was fixed trachea was central uh, resonance there was no change but he had a lot of bronchi and he was hypoxic 90% on room air and he needed oxygen we are in rb and a uh, nebulization with salbutamol because he had wrong kionis lungs bronchoconstriction he had uh, compromised circulation both the resp- pulse rate was slow and le- blood pressure was slow so we had to correct this uh, pulse rate by giving atropine to bring his heart rate up uh, instantaneously so that has been done and uh, saline normal saline bolus was fixed uh gcs was uh, 10 on admission but it was improving with this all the measures giving oxygen putting opa sucking secretions out and improving his cns uh, brain perfusion by increasing his blood pressure his uh, gcs was improving um, no focal neurology and cbs was 170 exposure lot of clues he was sitting like nothing he was incontinent uh, urinating and diarrhea and everything was there and temperature normal he doesn't have any bleeding or any head injury so evaluation focus history he went to field 2 to 3 hours ago seen by other farmers that he was sitting on the field and uh, family said he has taken treatment for psychiatric illness but as usual nobody knows what drugs were and he had some social issues as well so there are some clues towards some uh, poison um type of uh, his uh, story focused examination he was setting profusely uh, pupil spin point he had fasciculations bronchospasms and sinus bradycardia his abdomen was soft and he was smelly investigations ecg showed sinus bradycardia blood sugar normal right diagnosis could this be a pontine hemorrhage again well acute onset low gcs pinpoint pupil makes us to think about it but his reflexes were normal planted down and he was like setting bronchospasms lot of other other stuff was there well they can have bronchospasms if they have uh, aspirated but we need to think about other differential diagnosis since this uh, uh, psychiatric history is on board could be lithium overdose 
Lithium models people present with the generally GI symptoms. We know that diarrhea, vomiting kind of thing, but they have tremors. They, 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 they and it, it, they have tremors. Um, uh, and low GCS is a bit of a late finding in uh, lithium toxicity. They present with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, tremors, low BP, low heart rate, but next day they go into uh, uh, low GCS. But this is a very acute onset low GCS, so it's a bit unlikely. Could it be a trade by, well, again, uh, can only explain low GCS pinpoint pupil, sweating and other stuff cannot be explained. Then can it be organophosphate ingestion? The toxins come into play. Whole spectrum of cholinergic signs like sweating, lacrimation, salivation, bronchorrhea, a lot of things are there. He's a, a person who's having social issues and psychiatric illness as well. And he was smelly above all. In fact, relative brings an empty agrochemical bottle of organophosphate found in the field where the patient was. So this is the classical scenario. We uh, stabilize them, we manage them, we evaluate them. After some time, the real picture comes out. So this patient had a, a OP poisoning that is called organophosphate toxidrome and uh, due to, uh, he has ingested himself. So ladies and gentlemen, how do we manage this patient? He need decontamination, mainly activated charcoal. Gastric lavage might not help in this patient because it's more, more or less more than two hours. So he need activated charcoal in a protective manner. Antidote, he need IV atropine boluses to uh, minimize his uh, cholinergic uh, symptoms and signs. And then uh, once he's atropinized, he need uh, PAM. So he needs supportive care for respiratory failure and intermediate syndrome. So uh, cholinergic uh, syndrome could present with confusion or coma. Again, physiologically down, CNS uh, depressed state. They have meiosis, they have bradycardia, mainly bradycardia. A lot of them have hypotension. And a lot of symptoms uh, like uh, salivation, urinary and fecal incontinence, diarrhea will be there. So think about cholinergic toxidrome in a correct patient. So example would be organophosphate, carbamate and all. Of course, carbamate, you don't give PAM. Right, what are the tips to remember? If you see a person coming with this clinical picture, sudden onset, diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bronchorrhea, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, salivation, sweating, there's a mnemonic for that, dumbbells. You need to think about organophosphate toxidrome. Think of cholinergic toxidrome and the antidote of atropine. You might need atropine before you decontaminate these people. That is a very, very important. Anyway, this patient has bradycardia, therefore you need to do something up front. We are moving to the patient number three. Um, young college student is brought in by uh, emergency medical team after becoming combative at a concert. So he's very agitated and requires restraints. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen this type of patient since your clinical practice. Um, shouting, running, it's very difficult to manage these people. So he had a respiratory rate of 28, saturation wise normal, blood pressure high 170-92, his heart rate was high 138, GCS was perfect for 15, and he was having temperature. So is he physiologically stable or unstable? Looks he is physiologically stable, but he is physiologically stimulated, isn't he? Having a lot of uh, increased parameters. So he doesn't need any resuscitation per se. He need evaluation for the pathology. So focus history, he was well before the concept. There was no headache, no fever, nothing before this uh, concert. He's a, a person with uh, diabetes, has been on oral hypoglycemic agents, and he, he, he's a depressed patient, was on tricyclic antidepressants as well. Focus examination. He had uh, dilated pupil, flush skin, setting, agitation, and his psychotic acid. So his bowel sounds are increased. Um, other system examination was difficult because of aggressive nature. Investigations, we were able to do merely a CBS by pricking his finger, it was 150. 
So what are the differential diagnoses for this patient? Can encephalitis be a certain differential diagnosis? Um, well, fever and confusion, aggression can be explained, but uh, it's very acute, wasn't it? And uh, it was well before this so-called party and dilated pupils, no headache, acute NSAID drives us away from uh, encephalitis. Could it be thyrotoxic crisis, ladies and gentlemen? Well, thyrotoxic crisis could present in this state, physiological, arousable, agitated, tachycardic setting, but it's not something would happen uh, out of the blue after about two hours. No, patients should demonstrate uh, Patients should demonstrate uh, signs of thyrotoxicosis for at least a couple of days. Um, uh, can explain the signs and midrace is unlikely. No proceeding history of thyrotoxicosis or goiter, no signs of grave. So it's, it's again a bit unlikely, even though uh, we need to think about it. How about pheochromocytoma? So pheochromocytoma we know present with uh, setting, palpitation, high heart rate, high blood pressure, but uh, naturally it's, it's, it's episodic. It's episodic. You don't get one episode of your sign trauma and four. No, that's not the case. You get episodes of those. Um, uh, then the history and then uh, episodic presentation agit and agitation and psychosis is unlikely in pheochromocytoma, even though you can have elevated physiological status. Could it be a toxidrome then? Uh, we need to think about toxidromes as cell, young person coming with uh, acute onset physiological uh, rousable state, mentally uh, uh, excited state. Think about a toxidrome. And uh, in addition to that, he was uh, depressed. He was on uh, tricyclic antidepressants. So could tri tricyclic uh, odors explain this? Um, Anticholinergic toxidrome. Well, they can have high heart rate, uh, high blood pressure kind of thing, but um, uh, midrace is, is possible, yes. But do they get sweating and stuff? They generally have very dry, hot skin, don't they? Dilated pupils, tachycardia, temperature can explain, but sweating, decreased bowel sounds. And in, in a case of tricyclic, you um, decrease bowel sounds, which is unlikely for a, a tricyclic overdose, but we need to think that possibility as well in our mind. How about sympathomimetic toxidrome? Physiologically excited, mentally excited, CNS similar strain, dilated pupils, increased bowel sounds. So most of clinical symptoms and signs fix into uh, sympathomimetic toxidrome. In fact, his pocket search reveal amphetamine in his pockets. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a classic sympathomimetic toxidrome. Uh, he has taken amphetamine before this party and taken uh, additional stuff, uh, additional uh, number of pills causing this toxidrome for him. Right, how do you manage amphetamine overdose? Um, decontamination will be important, but if possible only. This, this man is agitated, aggressive, this and that, so it might not be possible for us to give him um, gastric lavage and, sorry, it has to be GL and uh, uh, activated charcoal. Uh, it would be difficult. Antidote, so he would need sedation upfront more than anything. Uh, for a couple of things, he would harm himself and the, 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 the physiological rousable, CNS rousable state could be brought back to normal if you give sedation. And treatment would be hydration and treatment for complication like, you know, rhabdomyolysis and temperature management would be really important in this type of patients. Um, a summary of uh, symptoms. So, Sympathomimetic toxidrome would present with hyper alert, agitation, hallucination, paronia, psychotic state. And vital signs would be um, high, hypothermic, tachycardic, high blood pressure and all. Pupils, of course, uh, midriatic, and um, they can have setting, hyperreflex and tremors. So example would be cocaine, amphetamines, uh, kind of thing. So these patients can present with chest pain as well because cocaine causes vasospasms. 
so there are so many symptoms and signs which drives us towards a toxidrome so we need to think about a person who admit himself a young person coming with adrenergic crisis tachycardia sweating midrasis agitation psychosis um, you need to think about uh, toxins as an etiology so there's a sympathomimetic toxidrome so of course we need to uh, rule out the other differential diagnosis as we discuss um, management would be uh, agitation control and hypothermia control would be the mainstay of management right uh, moving to the patient number 4 uh, this young college student brought in by his friends after being found confused in his room his oxygen was 98 respiratory rate 18 heart rate 120 blood pressure a bit high 160 gcs was 13 and temperature was again a bit high 100.8 so his his physiological is stable isn't he so he doesn't need any resuscitation per se but he need evaluation for his pathology so focus history he was well before one hour and he is a man who is taking treatment for manic depression focus examination uh, his pupils were dilated his tachycardic skin red and hot uh, very dry palpable he had a abdominal pain ab abdominal lump which seems to be a bladder bowel sounds were hyperactive and he is mumbling picking at his clothes something like this um uh, not 100% uh, compartment as investigations ecg shows sinus tachycardia and it shows wide qrs as well mm, his blood sugar was 120 right what are the what is the diagnosis so what are the differential diagnosis can we encounter a diagnosis of uh, encephalitis in this patient well fever confusion can be explained true but dilated pupil very acute onset cannot be explained isn't it he should have been having some headache for at least a day or two kind of uh, manic depression those people tend to be on lithium so could it be lithium toxicity they present with gi symptoms we know um diarrhea nausea vomiting they can have bradycardia hypotension confusion can happen but late feature and present with trem so it's it's bit unlikely to be lithium because it's other way around to be honest um can it be a sympathomimetic syndrome physiologically excited state so he is in physiological excited state and dilated pupil but no setting generally very aggressive now he was not now in the like the previous case he was really aggressive dilated pupil um very high heart rate setting and all but this patient has some features but his uh, skin was dry and hot and all and bowel sounds were sluggish so could this be anticholinergic toxidrome then they also presented physiological excited state altered mental state dilated pupil hyperactive bowel sounds urinary retention and red dry skin so i believe most of his clinical symptoms and signs are telling with this rather than uh, sympathetic toxidrome or lithium toxicity in fact one of his friend brought his drugs so the drug cardex and the canisters were brought so 20 tricyclic and depressant tablets were missing and his book showed that his uh, lithium was stopped one month ago so there was no history of uh, he hasn't he hasn't been on any sympathomimetic so this proves a case of uh, uh, tricyclic overdose which is anticholinergic syndrome um so the management would be gastric lavage and activate a charcoal up front and he would need the antidote for cardiac toxicity um because he showed signs of uh, qrs widening so that warrants treatment with uh, sodium bicarbonate it has to be 8.4 uh, you need 1 to 2 milli equivalent uh, sodium bicarbonate boluses what we generally do is to give 50 ml 2 3 
virus has boluses, 8.4%. Of course, you need a, a large uh, bow cannula, otherwise it's, it's, it's going to cause a lot of problems to the patient. Um, supportive care would be needed. They need to be observed for cardiac arrhythmias. They need to be on halter monitoring, uh, actually, and think about other cardiovascular complications and seizures as well, and hydration. Uh, so this patient was on supportive care, and we were able to discharge this patient after about two, three days after seen by psychiatrist as well. Um, so anticholinergic toxidrome, so mental state would be hypervigilance, agitation, hallucination most of the time, mumbling, uh, picking claws kind of thing. Pupils are mid will be mid dilated pupil, uh, vital signs, physiologically rousable state, tachycardic, hypertension, tachypnea. So other peripheral manifestations will be really, really important to differentiate from other sympathomimetic state. They have, uh, these people would have flush skin, dry mucous membrane, decreased bowel sounds. You could feel bladder, palpable bladder, kind of. Um, so then you can differentiate these people from other toxidromes. Examples would be tricyclic antidepressant, cyclobenzapine, a lot of drugs. You can read this list. Right, what are the tips to remember or learning points? about anticholinergic signs. So mad as hatter, blind as a bat, hot as a hair, uh, red as a beet, and dry as a bone. So with all these peripheral signs, you see a person with depressed mental status and um, a elevated physiological status, high heart rate, high blood pressure kind of. And importantly, ECG shows QRS widening. Think about uh, anticholinergic toxidrome. So the uh, treatment would be if they have uh, cardiac toxicity features, they need immediate sodium bicarbonate. So uh, these are the uh, four classic toxidromes, anticholinergic, sympathomimetic, sedative, and cholinergic. Um, if you see a patient uh, uh, with... Uh, you can see the uh, comparison between each and every one, especially heart rate, oral findings, blood pressure, mental status, uh, eyes and skin. Um, it's very important for us to uh, think about uh, toxins upfront. So if I move into the summary, um, so we need to always resuscitate unstable patients by doing ABCD before evaluation and management of pathology. This is a golden principle in uh, acute and emergency medicine. Think about the physiology first. If we can stabilize them, then we have time for evaluate the pathology. So how do we uh, stabilize these people would be by airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Don't forget exposure. Exposure gives you clues, a lot of clues towards the pathology, um, what type of pathology that we are dealing with. Um, focus history is important. In any, any patient, they will hide the specific toxin. So therefore, always talk to family. I mean, talking to family is important for any patient care, but you need to talk to the family and uh, clarify these details, what type of things that they have ingested and ask from friends and importantly compare your findings with the history with the clinical science and investigation results is it telling and in a in a in, in a person with uh, bradycardia we would never think of sympathetic sympathomimetic uh, intoxication would we then the focus examination is most important step this will give a lot of clues a lot of clues towards the diagnosis. This include vital signs, mental status, pupils, bowel sounds, skin changes, a lot of things. So I would say the, 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 the rest of the things would depend on focus examination. And ECG and CBS is a must at the presentation. 
because it gives a lot of clues. CBS, uh, one thing would be uh, if it is low, we need to treat for hypoglycemia. Am I okay to talk? So um, ECG is really, really important because uh, if you see uh, wide QRS, uh, QT problems, then we can think of uh, sodium channel blocker ingestion and uh, bradycardia, heart blocks could be due to OP, Kaneru, a um, lot of other drugs as well. And CBS is important to rule out um, uh, hypoglycemia. And then consider antidote before decontaminations. In some people, especially if they are unstable, you need to give a person with bradycardia, um, forget about the pathology, you manage the bradycardia by giving atropine in, in, in acute setup. Um, uh, therefore, you need to think about decontam consider antidote before decontamination even. Um, finally, Consider toxidromes in your differential diagnosis at the outset, even in the absence of a history of orders. If the patient himself or family says that he has ingested something, the clinical signs and symptoms might well be due to that. But even in the absence of this uh, uh, history, we need to think toxins as a possible etiology. As I demonstrated in a previous slide, there are few etiologies for any pathology. It could be infective, inflammatory, hereditary, neoplastic, um, metabolic, vascular, or toxin. So we need to have all those things in our mind when we analyze a patient. So ladies and gentlemen, toxidrome is, even the word is new, but it is nothing new. It's a certain etiological factor which can cause clinical symptoms and signs like you think about metabolical causes, like you think about vascular causes, like you think about infective causes. I know most of us think about infective causes when we are encountered with fever, don't we? Uh, first thing come to our most of people's hand is antibiotic, but it's not the case. Like you think about infection, think about toxins at upfront. It could cause a lot of symptoms and signs. As I delineated in my presentation, there's a way how to analyze these patients. And if you think, I would say this is the most important uh, message in this presentation, think about toxins at upfront. If you think it, you might be able to catch little, little, little things in the history and the examination, and then the correct diagnosis will be achieved and the correct management will be done and the patient can be definitely be discharged in a happy mode, right? I would like to uh, thank a couple of people, all my patients, from whom I have gathered my knowledge, and Arosh Disanayaka, who has uh, shared his knowledge with me, and President and Council of the Ceylon College of Physicians, Dr. Anand Vijayakrama, uh, and other council members, and our chairperson, Madam, and uh, the team who are helping us facilitating this uh, new normal presentations, um, and all of you who have joined uh, in the Zoom, early morning, despite your busy schedules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Senaratne. It was a very clear presentation. Uh, now the session is open for any questions if you have. You can text in your questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, and I'm sure Dr. Senaratne will be happy to answer the questions. Are there any questions? You can text in your questions. So until we get questions, like, so Ganaka, yeah, it was a very, very informative um, presentation. I have one uh, question, like, so we'll say if somebody comes with a diazepam overdose and morphine overdose, how uh, is it, a, how would you differentiate the two? Is there any way of differentiating? Well, uh, both are causes for sedative uh, toxidrome. 
physiological status uh, would be yes. uh, well cns status will be uh, depressed both, both would kind of come with uh, drowsiness kind of uh, physiological status if you analyze in you know, opioid dodos they will most likely tend to be apneic or hyp uh, bradypneic that uh, the respiratory rate will be most likely low and rather towards apnea side so that the saturation but in uh, benzodiazepine and uh, diazepam dodos even though they are drowsy their physiology is not that compromised so that is one feature we can uh, make use of and the pupil of course uh, opioid dodos they have characteristically very very small pupil but the but the the diazepam would not uh, do that and then uh, if you are in a doubt then comes naloxone so you give naloxone which is a very very short acting drug it gives instantaneous results in a opioid order so it's no harm giving naloxone if you are in a doubt whether this is benzodiazepine or opioid because if it is opioid you will have the results thank you very much yeah that's uh, and then the uh, surrounding history and everything will also might help us no of otherwise course. Like, of if you course. don't have that yeah thank you very much uh, we have got uh, one question how would you differentiate carbon uh, monoxide poisoning versus cyanide poisoning well uh, that i would say is not the uh, 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 topic that we discuss yes. true that we have uh, so many uh, poisons in our uh, armory but we discuss mainly this uh, four things shall we move to the next question yes is there a way to differentiate serotonin syndrome from anticholinergic syndromes and i can see a question how can we differentiate serotonin tc and amphetamine order so tc and amphetamine um, so amphetamine i mean we discussed those two cases amphetamine um, is uh, sympathomimetic tc is anticholinergic so both could cause uh, physiological stimulatory status and uh, cns uh, mental uh, stimulatory status but uh, the, the 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 trick comes from uh, peripheral signs of tca uh, tricyclic and dipson like uh, anticholinergic signs dry skin very hot kind of uh, sympathomimetics would uh, cause diarrhea uh, uh, kind of picture and then the bowel sounds will be differ in both uh, sympathomimetics would have increased bowel sounds anticholinergics would have uh, sluggish bowel sounds of course pupil would be dilated in both um, so those are the clues uh, directing towards uh, these two obviously we might need uh, um Uh, and then uh, uh, we might need uh, other history uh, what type of tablets that they have taken but and then the other feature you could make use of is agitation sympathomimetic like amphetamine they are really really agitated violent aggressive um tricyclic antidepressants people they don't they don't behave like that that do they they no. they are a bit confused true but they are not aggressive as such but sympathomimetics totally so that is one of the main feature you use to differentiate between uh, sympathomimetic and tricyclic um thank you ganaka and there what is, is the current consensus regarding cut off time, time for gastric lavage well uh, very good question i would say um so gastric lavage uh, has been in the practice ironically whenever a patient who has taken a toxin comes we tend to do that but there are so many studies showing that it the complication it causes is huge aspiration pneumonia pneumonitis lot of stuff um and the 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 cut off time would be 2 hours or oh, i would say it's one hour if you think about very significant very heavy amount of uh, toxin ingestion you could go even up to 2 hours but if it is not okay. that very big amount i might not do it after 
one hour. One. If you do it, the more definitely not after two hours. If you do it, we need to get all the precautions to prevent the person being uh, uh, aspirated. Okay. That is an important thing. We have another question, a clinical scenario. If a patient were to have overdosed on both diazepines uh, and tricyclic antidepressants <laughs> and the respiratory rate is eight, has broad QRS complexes, what will you give first, flumazenil or sodium bicarbonate? Well, uh, if you now, uh, that depends on his, uh, now in A, B, C, D, E, first you correct airway. Uh, so if the patient had airway problems causing respiratory, which is unlikely in this case, it comes from ventilatory failure, then breathing. So respiratory rate eight, with uh, normal saturation, I wouldn't be much uh, bothered about it. If the saturation is low, I would like to correct uh, airway and go for airway maneuvers and then intubation kind of thing. And then comes C, so if the circulation is compromised with the broad QRS, then that needs uh, urgent attention too. So, but uh, this question asks uh, if the patient were having uh, both toxin on board and having respiratory rate eight and uh, wide QR, is it? Uh, yes. So, oh, yeah. uh, well, respiratory rate eight with uh, hypoxia, that has to be addressed at the ABCD stage itself by doing some uh, ARV yeah. manual, so uh, intubation or whatever. And then if the blood, if, if the, uh, so that, uh, I don't think uh, flumazenil will, would do that. Flumazenil will take some time to act. Okay. If the QRS is wide, let's say the, the patient present with uh, tachycardia, hypotension, and uh, why tachycardia and hypotension had to be dealt at the ABCD stage, and Q, white QRS, of course, need the sodium bicarbonate. So, and in uh, fact, I think this is an emergency. You, know, you exactly. will be use giving both. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will end up in giving both, both, obviously. But that would be the sequence of uh, action. Okay, right. Um, in the absence of any questions, and we are like about to uh, finish our time. So I think uh, we will wind up this session. I would like to, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, present a certificate of appreciation on behalf of Ceylon College of Physicians uh, for the excellent talk uh, done by uh, Dr. Ganaksena Ratna. Uh, may I present the certificate to Uh, and uh, so I hope that you had a very fruitful hour, uh, especially the trainees would have uh, got the maximum benefit of uh, Ganaka's talk. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ganaka Senaratna and all the audience for uh, your presence today and like, I mean, so joining us uh, online. Um, and we will close the session now. Thank you very much.